thank you so much. Um, I'm running from one talk to the other. So um, allow me 30 seconds to get my breath back. A big thank you again to um, Dr. Harjit Dumra for organizing such a magnificent show, for being as hospitable. So the entire KD team, hats off for the hospitality that we have received in the last 24 hours. I'm gobsmacked. And um, thank you for inviting me to the meeting again. So what I'm going to do over the next 25 minutes is to talk about interstitial lung disease. And you see I have taken the uh, speaker's prerogative of modifying the title slightly. I've said years in review rather than a year in review in interstitial lung disease. And that's because studies, research had stopped or slowed down during the COVID period. So I'll take the last two to three years rather than taking just the last one year. So over the next 25 minutes, these are the four questions that we'll try and answer together. One, is there the possibility of screening in patients with interstitial lung disease? Is that reality or is that a pipe dream? The second question is about biomarkers in interstitial lung disease. Is it time to implement it in our clinical practice or is that going to happen in the not so distant future? The third is talking about treatment of fibrotic interstitial lung disease current approach and future trends, and we'll start, st stop, finish off by talking about delivery of drugs in interstitial lung disease. So the first question, is screening a reality? So before we do that, let's take a step back and define what's the challenge in patients with ILD. The diagnostic delay in patients with interstitial lung disease, according to the ILD India registry, is to the tune of four years. So four years between onset of symptoms, and the diagnosis. And this results in poor prognosis, and I'll show you data in a moment. The fact that a lot of patients fall under the umbrella diagnosis of chronic lung disease, they're diagnosed as COPD, given inhalers, and the disease diagnosis is delayed even further. And the fact that timely diagnosis reduces unnecessary investigations and improves outcome. So what is the effect of diagnostic delay is the first question we're trying to answer. So a patient who is diagnosed within one year of onset of symptoms, lives for more than five years in 70% of cases. Lives for more than five years in 70% of cases. A patient who's diagnosed at four years and beyond lives for five years in less than 20% of cases. So that's the difference that you can make by diagnosing this disease early. So question arises, why did most of the patients in the ILD India registry get diagnosed at four years or beyond? And there are valid reasons for this which are applicable not just in India, but also applicable globally. The fact that the disease creeps onto you, it's an insidious onset. The symptoms happen to be cough and breathlessness, which is true of all respiratory disease. Initially, there's minimal symptom burden. Within physicians, within general practitioners, there's scarce knowledge about fibrotic interstitial lung disease, and most of these patients, or a lot of these patients, get treated under the umbrella term of chronic lung disease with inhaled drugs, etc. and the fact that specialist centers, which are few and far between anyway, have long waiting times for the treatment of these individuals. So what are the potential solutions for all of us? The potential solutions are greater awareness with meetings like we're doing today, or you maybe do in your own cities back home. Finger clubbing is an important predictor, and make sure you look at the fingers and you listen to the chest. Listening to the chest is important, as important if not more important than clubbing, but I'll come to that in a moment. The fact that with COVID or even before COVID, there's a lot of CT scans that are getting done, and they're getting done for a variety of other reasons. However, on these CT scans, look for features of early interstitial lung disease, and that will improve your early diagnosis to a very large extent. So this is an editorial written by my good friend, Vincent Cotton from France, and he says that the stethoscope remains the most important tool in the early diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the most important tool in early diagnosis. And this is a figure which is from 2019, which looked at uh, screening for interstitial lung disease. You can see that the changes are predominant in the basis and they're subtle changes. And if you listen here, here, if you listen to the back infrascapular region and you hear tackles which are bilateral, it's got a huge predictive value for interstitial lung disease. And then there are digitally recorded stethoscopes which some of the youngsters in the audience might own. And if you record sounds and hear crackles there, it tells you that this patient can have early interstitial lung disease. How good is this? And this was a study which is from 2021, which looks at 
the various categories of HR, uh, interstitial lung disease. So fibrotic interstitial lung disease, definite UIP, possible UIP, inconsistent with UIP. But if you look at the prediction, bilateral velcro crackles, such a high rate of prediction, unilateral velcro crackles, it is definitely not interstitial lung disease. So bilateral basal crackles, not just with IPF, but something which helps you to predict interstitial lung disease early with a great degree of sanctity. And this is the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial from the US, where they found about 15%, 1-5% of patients screened for lung cancer actually had early interstitial lung disease. That's how high the incidence of this problem is. So the prevalence of ILD was first detected in a lung cancer screening program, 2011. That's the National Lung Cancer Screening Program. You can have subtle changes like you see here, septal thickening and a bit of ground glass, or you can have early honeycombing at the basis, but honeycombing that all of you would recognize as being features of lung fibrosis. So it can appear in both of these forms. So there was a terminology which was put forth for this disorder, which was called ILAs or interstitial lung abnormalities. So interstitial lung abnormalities are defined as presence of CT findings, like you saw in the previous slide, compatible with ILD, but without previous suspicion of interstitial lung disease. So you've done a CT for a different reason. You pick up these interstitial abnormalities, honeycombing, traction bronchiectasis in these individuals. When there are associated respiratory signs and symptoms, so the patient might not have complained of symptoms before, but you see the CT, you call the patient back, you ask them about breathlessness, you ask them about cough, they say, yes, doc, it's not troublesome, but I do feel breathless climbing two flights of stairs, or I do feel breathless, I do have a cough, which is predominant at night. So those are patients with respiratory signs and symptoms. So these are called mild ILD rather than subclinical ILD. And ILAs are often associated with respiratory symptoms, functional impairment, risk of progression, even a risk of mortality, which is why if you pick up ILAs, it is important to follow these patients up in the long term, even if they don't have respiratory symptoms to start with. So that's the background which is the patient population you would like to screen? That's the question that we are trying to answer today. So patients above the age of 60, more in the male sex, patients who are tobacco smokers, people who have environmental exposures like asbestos, like coal mines, etc. We have the eastern part of the state which has got the coal mine belt, so we see a lot of these patients with ILAs in that belt. And one mutation that they have spoken about, one genetic mutation specifically, which is the MUC5B, and you can see the number on there which I won't read, but that's a MUC5B allele, which the presence of which should prompt screening for interstitial lung disease. So advanced age, male sex, tobacco exposure, occupational environmental exposure, and a family history, especially with a MUC5B mutation, are the predisposing risk factors. So that's for IPF. What about non-IPF ILD? What about the category of fibrotic ILD? So again, familiar interstitial lung disease, especially RA ILD, seem to have a significant genetic predisposition. Again, CTD as a whole, and we are talking about rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis with SCL70 antibody, and polymyositis, dermatomyositis, with the anti-synthetase and the anti-MDA5 antibodies. These are categories of CTD which you would definitely screen for presence of interstitial lung disease. And occupational exposure, we have spoken about in IPF. So metal, wood dust, asbestos, et cetera, are the occupational exposures when you need to screen. This is a lovely table, which is about a year old, which looks at screening for fibrotic interstitial lung disease. And I'll take you through this, because I think this is relevant to your clinical practice. So individuals with suspected ILD or high risk, you do a comprehensive baseline screening. What is meant by a comprehensive baseline screening? You do symptom assessment, you do physical examination looking for crackles and clubbing, you would obviously do an HRCT in these individuals, and then you would look at lung physiology, so lung function testing, and a six minute walk test. Based on these findings, you would categorize the patients into three groups. You would categorize them as clinically significant interstitial lung disease, in which case you would uh, follow them up with medications, etc., at three to 12 months. The group we are interested in is this middle group, subclinical interstitial lung disease. These patients merit follow-up. The follow-up mandated in various guidelines is three to six months. You would call them back for repeat lung physiology, 
annual CT scans, and you would expect that about 20% of these patients, one in five of these patients, will go on to develop florid interstitial lung disease within the next five years. So 20% developing florid interstitial lung disease within the next five years. If there's no ILD, you would, depending on risk factors, decide about follow-up versus discharge. So that's the risk factors that we spoke about a little while ago. So that takes me at the end of my first bit, which is looking at screening. And my carry home message is, what I want all of you to remember from this category is that early identification of individuals with fibrotic ILD poses lots of challenges which we have pointed out. Mainly it's occupational exposures, family history, which predate preclinical and overt fibrotic interstitial lung disease. And in the US, you have screening programs for ILD already. And the next couple of years, three years, probably in India, we'll have a tailored screening program for our patients with interstitial lung disease. However, you'll have patients who come and ask you, I've got a family member who's got interstitial lung disease, got a family member who's died of interstitial lung disease. Can you screen me? And that's where these guidelines become relevant for you today. You need to follow these algorithm in screening individuals. So that's the first bit. That's talking about screening. Which brings me to my second subtopic, which is looking at biomarkers from bench to bedside. And this will take some more time compared to screening to evolve, but I think it's important to think about this in your clinical practice. So this is the profile study, which is a 10-year study which started in 2015. It looks at recruiting patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where at baseline, you do lung physiology measurements, you do DLCO, you look, do an ABG, and you do quality of life questionnaires. And then from screening, you follow these patients up at an interval of six months, and then annually for a period of 10 years. And along with the lung physiology and physical examination, you collect blood in these individuals, and you do it to look at matrix metalloproteins. You look at collagen degradation products. And that's the biomarkers that we are talking about at the moment. So don't have to remember the fine print of this slide. Important to understand what we are doing here. So you understand that when there is fibrosis, there is breakdown of collagen. So the numbers that you see on there, the BGM, the C1M, the C5M, etc., are all collagen degradation products. They are matrix metalloprotein. You're looking at two categories of patients. You're looking at patients, well, you're looking at three categories of patients. You're looking at healthy individuals as a control, but then in the active arm, you're looking at two categories of patients. You're looking at patients who've got stable idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, stable over a period of five years, that's stability, or you're looking at progressive pulmonary fibrosis, where this lung function decline over a period of time. So the stable versus the progressive. And you want to have markers which show that you can predict progressive disease versus stable disease. So think about it, if you went, sat in your clinic, and you could have three markers which told you, this is the IPF patient which will progress, versus this is the IPF patient who will remain stable, it will help you in treatment, it will help you in prognostication, which is why these biomarkers are so very important. So that's one, identifying the progressive phenotype. The second is, some of these matrix metalloproteins, the collagen degradation products, will also predict increased mortality. And again, you can see a host of uh, different markers, and you can see the p-values are significant, but these are not relevant to us today because they're not available in clinical practice. So predictors of mortality, predictors of progression. Let's see what we have. So this is a publication from less than a year ago, which looks at these proteomic markers, but four markers which are available in most countries in clinical day-to-day -day practice. And these are surfactant protein D, MMP7, CA125, and CA199, which all of you would be familiar with. So four markers, surfactant protein D, MMP7, CA125, and CA199. So disease versus healthy categorization seems to be done best with surfactant protein D and MMP7. Mortality prediction seems to be done well with CA125, and progression versus stable disease seems to be done best with CA199. This looks at identification of progressive disease and the four different markers that you saw just now. And just to cut a long story short, my carry home message for you is that prediction of increased mortality seems to be done best with the marker we have in clinical practice, which is CA125. 
And the profile study tells us that in clinical practice, if you repeat a CA-125 first at three months after diagnosis, and then every six months, you can predict mortality in these individuals. So that's something that's not come in the guidelines as yet, but you would expect that to come in the ATS-ERS guidance in the not so distant future. So the patients I've shown you are from IPF. Does this also collaborate, collaborate in patients with non-IPF ILD, the so-called progressive pulmonary fibrosis category? And this is the injustice study, which is far more recent, started in 2019, but done on similar lines. So lung physiology, six minute walk distance, and looking at blood biomarkers. And let me give you the bottom line. This you can see are a variety of different biomarkers. The top ones are the ones which are available in clinical practice. And they looked at various endpoints like, an I, like it was seen in IPF. So mortality, change in biomarkers predicting uh, mortality, disease progression, FVC change, and so on. So let me show you the bottom line. Again, CA-125 in IPF, MMP-7, predicts increased mortality based on 10 different studies. So this is a meta-analysis, small number of patients, about 200 patients in 10 studies, but MMP7 seems to correlate best with increased mortality in the non-IPF ILD category of patients. Is it just about mortality? It's not. MMP7 also seems to correlate beautifully with decline of FVC. So in patients where the FVC goes down quickly, the MMP7 levels rise quickly. So that's another important marker in patients with non-IPF ILD. This is the terminology that I learned new when I was preparing this talk, it's theranostic. So what is theranostic? Theranostic is a marker which has got both therapeutic and diagnostic value. So therapeutic plus diagnostic is theranostic. So how is this theranostic? So patients were given perfinidone or nintadenib and their MMP7 levels were measured. The patients who responded better, had lesser decline of FVC, also had a greater reduction of the levels like MMP7, surfactant, protein D, etc. So treatment and response to treatment is also something that can be done with the help of these markers. And it was true both for nintadenib and for perfinidone. So carry home message for the non-IPF category of patients, MMP7 and CA125 are ready for prime time use. This is a slide from the US. So they're ready for prime time use in the management of IPF and progressive pulmonary fibrosis. And I want you to remember that one message to take home from this segment of the talk. The next segment is talking about the treatment of fibrotic interstitial lung disease. So fibrotic interstitial lung disease, what are the current approaches and future directions? So in this category of patients, which has now been called progressive pulmonary fibrosis, we have two studies which can be talk, talked as having changed the concept, the thought process about management of this disease process. This is called the Senesis study, which looked at patients with systemic sclerosis having interstitial lung disease and the treatment with nintadenib. And to cut a long story short, so you can see two different arms, nintadenib 150 milligrams twice daily versus placebo, and these patients were followed up for a period of 12 months. What were they looking at? They looked at FVC as the primary endpoint at 52 weeks, and they looked at absolute change in baseline on quality of life questionnaires at 52 weeks. And they found that over 52 weeks, the decline of FVC on patients on nintadenib was far lesser as compared to placebo. So the decline of FVC over a period of one year was far lesser in the nintadenib group as compared to the placebo arm. The other study was the inbuilt study, which I want you to remember. So again, patients categorized into nintadenib versus placebo, and again, the decline of FVC over 52 weeks was far lesser in the category of patients who had nintadenib versus the patients who were not on nintadenib. So two studies, inbuilt and senesis, laid the foundation of what we are going to say. So it's not just these two studies. Now there's multiple studies, and this is dated till December 2022, which have been completed and which are in the process of getting completed. And I won't read through this. It's not relevant for you to remember all this. But let me give you the results of these different trials, which have come out, phase three trials, in 2022. So first, nintadenib slows FVC decline, as you heard, in patients with SSC-ILD. Second, 
nintadenib slows FVC decline in patients with progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. Third, perfinidone slows FVC decline in patients with unclassifiable PFILD on CT. Fourth, perfinidone slows FVC decline in patients with PFILD. Fifth, and these are trials from the end of 2022, Tripostadil improves six-minute walk distance in FVC in ILD with group three pulmonary hypertension. You know that's a prostacyclin analog that's just been licensed in India, which makes it so very relevant. And sixth, post-COVID times, this is the drug all of you are familiar with, all of us are familiar with, tocilizumab, given early on in SSC ILD, seems to work better than any other drug discovered till date. So that's the gist of all the studies that we have. So those are the studies. Let's think about the concept now. So you have patients, so the red is fibrosis, the blue is inflammation. I want you to remember that. Red is fibrosis, blue is inflammation. So in patients with IPF, you have fibrosis all the way through. There is not much of inflammation. It's all about fibrosis, which is why giving steroids to patients with IPF cause more damage than good. Antifibrotic therapy in the form of nintarinib or perfinidone started early on only results in slowing of fibrosis, slowing in decline of FVC in that population. However, the non-IPF ILD category of patients, it's different. How is it different? You start off with very mild disease. Remember, early detection I spoke about. So there's neither much of inflammation nor fibrosis. Then you have inflammation, and then you have the overlap between inflammation and fibrosis, and then it goes on to a completely fibrotic process, analogous to what you have in patients with IPF. So here in the blue, you would want to start patients with immunomodulatory therapy. Your steroid and your steroid-sparing agents, like the MMF, the cyclophosphamide, and so on. And then as you have more of red, you have combined antifibrotic and immunomodulatory therapy. I want you to hold that thought simply because when you think about novel therapeutics in IPF or in non-IPF ILD, the variety of drugs chosen are chosen on this principle. It's either immunomodulatory or it's antifibrotic. Which brings me to this very recent study, beautiful illustration from The Lancet, which looks at these two pathways, the immunomodulatory pathway and the fibromodulatory pathway. The drugs that you see, which I don't want you to remember, the ones in red are the ones which have undergone phase three studies already and would be licensed in various countries in the next three years. So the list for fibromodulatory, antifibrotic seems to be far more uh, robust as compared to immunomodulatory therapy, but you can see there's hope on the horizon. There's a variety of drugs, both in the immunomodulatory and in the fibromodulatory baskets, which will get licensed over a period of the next two to three years. My last section in the last two minutes is talking about delivery to drugs in patients with interstitial lung disease. And again, I leave you with the concept because these drugs are not available for clinical practice as of today, but will be in the next one year. So this is looking at a topical inhaled drug for delivery in patients with IPF. And they're look at, looking at salbutamol. So they don't think salbutamol works in IPF. They're just trying to find out whether inhaled salbutamol, nebulized salbutamol, actually reaches the area where the disease is in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And they designed a special uh, nebulizer machine, which is like the mesh nebulizer, in delivering these drugs to the patients. And you can see, if the drug has to go into the alveolar region, the size of the drug particle needs to be less than two millimicron. Less than two millimicron, which is the small sized particles we talk about when we talk about asthma and COPD. There's a couple of important things that you need to remember from these radio tracer uptake studies. The fact that drugs which are 1.5 micron, so less than two micron, get deposited better in the alveolar spaces, and the fact that in patients with diseased lung, as opposed to healthy lung, this greater deposition of the drug. I want you to remember this because it's important. So in normal people, the deposition of the same particle size of drug is lesser as compared to people who have diseased lung in the form of IPF or ILD. So penetration depends on disease severity. Smaller the particle, greater the disease process, greater the penetration to the alveolar spaces. This is a proof of concept study, a phase three study with a drug called Galactin-3 inhibitor. So Galactin-3 mediates inflammation in patients. It causes fibrosis in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They did a lavage in these patients before 
and after, and they found that with the use of this galactin-3 inhibitor, the greatest concentration of this drug was within the alveoli when the size of the particles were 1.5 micron and lesser. And it was not just in the airways, even in the bloodstream, inflammatory markers came down when you had inhaled galactin-3 inhibitor in these individuals. So greater concentration in the alveoli, reduction of inflammatory markers in the blood, which is proof of concept to show that this drug works. Now, one last concept I want to leave you with, and I'll take just a minute extra. Where would these drugs work in the ILD basket? So you know, all of you know that the drug, ILD as a disease can be central or lobular, so central or peripheral. So drugs which are diseases which are central like chronic HP, like um, uh, sarcoidosis, etc. There, the small airways along with the alveoli are what are affected. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, asbestosis, etc. diseases where the disease is mainly peripheral. And the argument is that in chronic HP, which is the commonest ILD in India according to the ILD India registry, in sarcoid, in drug-induced ILD, use of nebulized drugs is the way going forward. So my concluding remarks from this talk, what I want you to remember, A, early diagnosis is a must because it translates into better results. And we as a community, as Indians, seem to be poor at early diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. Biomarkers are the future going forward. In the next five years, you will hear a lot of, about biomarkers, but MMP7 and CA125 seem to be ready for prime time use today. Drugs which are both immunomodulatory and fibromodulatory, more fibromodulatory, less immunomodulatory, but there's a long list which is in the pipeline for both IPF and non-IPF ILD, and new modalities of drug development in the inhaled route is something that we'll hear of more going forward. Thank you very much for listening.